We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Our Focus Online Lecture One Seventy Two, Retina Session Twenty Four. Today we have with us Dr. Dhanshri Ratra, and uh, she'll be talking on retinal artery occlusions. I request Dr. Lalit Verma sir to please introduce, ma'am. Thank you, Rolika. Dhanshri, to the retina world, it does not require any introduction. You see, the topic which she is speaking on is uh, very, very relevant to all the ophthalmologists. Uh, you know, retinal artery occlusion is one of the one of the few, I must say, emergencies uh, in ophthalmology, especially when it is involving the central retinal artery and the central vision goes. And very, very important. Why I said emergencies because the therapeutic window, or or what we call you have to act immediately within, say, I think four to six hours is the critical period. And uh, more than that, uh, uh, apart from you know taking immediate remedial measures, which I think uh, Dhanashree will be elaborating, one needs to find out, uh, investigate, and find out the cause of the stroke. What we call this is actually a stroke of the eye, so as to you know prevent a similar thing happening uh, <coughs> in the body. And Dhanashree Yatra, you see, very dear colleague and friend, the senior consultant at Shankaratrale, you can see the, the slide itself speaks volumes of her achievements, so many awards, you see first more than half of the slide is occupied with all the awards uh, possible everywhere and she has been involved in a lot of uh, research projects and trials also. Besides that, uh, you know, section editor of a retina in IGO and reviewer of very, uh, you know, uh, important uh, journals in ophthalmology and publications, uh, you know, has crossed already 75 peer reviewed publications, multiple chapters, and invited lectures and keynote addresses. So, I'm not reading all the gold medals and awards which she has won, but uh, but uh, I'll request her to, you know, start because we are very rigid in time that, you know, within one hour we have to finish. And then, she, you will have around 40 45 minutes uh, uh, to the max to, you know, tell all, all the listeners. You see, this episode of Eye Focus by Center for Sight is watched extensively, extensively. And thanks to Santosh Honavar, who has, you know, made this program so diligently. And uh, this particular program is very, very relevant uh, for all the, I would say for all the clinicians, in fact, because everybody has to recognize uh, this arterial block, primarily because of the sequelae it can leave behind, especially, as I said, if CRS central vision is involved. And if you fail to recognize, I think uh, that's a disaster. So over to you, Dhanashree. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, introduction sir. And uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Santosh, for this uh, very kind invitation. I am quite aware of the wild popularity of this program. And I'm very happy to participate in this program. I would like to congratulate Dr. Santosh and the entire CFS team for this very wonderful initiative that they have undertaken because uh, teaching is the most important uh, job that one can do and the knowledge can only be, you know, it is important and it can be only useful when you share it. So it is definitely a wonderful initiative and I'm really happy to be with you all here today. So I would like to share my screen now. So yes, I'm okay. going to talk to you. Yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah. You can maximize it. Yes. Yeah. It is uh, maximized. Is yeah, it, yeah, it's perfect. full screen now. Okay. Huh? Yeah, perfect, yeah. perfect, perfect. So I'm going to talk to you today on retinal arterial occlusions. I have no financial interest. But uh, before I talk to you about the topic, I would like to talk to you about one person who has done the most pioneering work in retinal venous, uh, retinal vascular occlusions. And that is none other than Dr. Sohan Singh Khairi. So, originally from Punjab, this Indian uh, man has done extensive work. He's 95 years old 
and for 65 years he has dedicated his life to research in uh, retinal vascular occlusions and uh, he has done many animal studies and prospective studies and he has cleared many many myths about the retinal vascular occlusions that we had uh, with us and the current knowledge that we have now is basically mainly from his studies and his many publications and uh, IJO did a special issue on him and dedicated this uh, feature to him that was a really a wonderful thing for IJO to do and uh, of course Dr. Harry has written many many publications but this is one uh, latest publication in this issue of IJO that is December 2018. This is a review uh, article on central retinal artery occlusion and I would urge you to read this uh, wonderful article. Uh, most of the information which I am going to give you today is uh, from his article. So after having uh, done that, uh, I would like to just outline my talk. Uh, uh, I am going to go in a little bit reverse direction today. And generally you start with anatomy and pathophysiology and risk factors and, and uh, signs and symptoms and investigations and then treatment, etc. But uh, we all agree that central retinal artery occlusion is the most important uh, clinical uh, disease that you can come across. And it is very important that every single ophthalmologist, whatever may be your specialty or subspecialty, you must know how to treat a patient who comes to you with a central retinal artery occlusion. So I am going to start with the emergency room management because I have seen uh, residents and PGs uh, getting fumbled and getting hassled and uh, really not knowing what to do when actually a patient of CRO turns up in the emergency. So for number one, I'm going to talk to you about how to tackle, how to manage a patient who comes to you with a CRO. Then we'll go on to some relevant anatomy, the pathophysiology, the risk factors, investigations, some of the other treatments that have been uh, tried and other retinal artery occlusions. So if you have any questions, you can stop me, uh, although I have not, uh, uh, I, mean, I have prepared it as a didactic lecture, but feel free to uh, ask me any questions if you have. Sure, ma'am, they'll ask. Sure. So uh, imagine you are posted in the emergency room or you get paged for an uh, emergency where you have a 60 year old or old man who comes with sudden painless loss of vision in one eye. And the typical description is like uh, it is the, the vision loss is like switching off of a light bulb. Uh, the patient may volunteer this uh, particular uh, you know history or uh, this particular uh, way of description. Or if he does not, you can ask the patient whether it is like switching off of a light light bulb or whether it is like a curtain falling. And if the patient says that yes, it's like a bulb being switched off, then 100% it has to be a central retinal artery occlusion. So don't waste uh, much time in asking history or anything else. You can just take a very short history about the important question. Most important being the duration of his vision loss. Uh, how much, uh, you know, how much time has passed since he noticed this vision loss. Just ask about any major uh, prominent illnesses or any medicinal allergies. Quickly check the vision either with the Snellen chart or simply with finger counting if you don't have the Snellen chart. Check the pupils and then check the retina. There is no need to dilate the waste time in dilating the pupil for fundus examination. You can directly check the retina either with indirect or if you can't see, then see with the direct ophthalmoscope. What you have to note is the cherry red spot, which is seen very prominently in the fundus and you have a lot of opacification around that. The disc may be either normal or it may be pale or it may be hyperemic depending on the time duration. And sometimes you can also see a cattle trucking sign where there is a, the blood blood the blood column in the blood vessels will be broken into small segments. And if you see this, it's, it is diagnostic of central retinal artery occlusion. And all this should not take uh, longer than a few minutes, maybe about five minutes. Okay. Once the CRO is confirmed, uh, immediately go on to the treatment without wasting any further time. So I am going to give you the seven steps which you should do in the emergency room immediately. So start immediately on the carbogen inhalation. That is, ask the patient to breathe in a paper bag immediately. If the paper bag is not available, you can just ask the patient to cup his own hands uh, against his mouth and nose and to keep breathing into the cupped hands. This will deliver the carbon dioxide to the patient, which will help with vasodilation. Next thing is, second at the, at the same time while the patient is doing this breathing thing, you start digital massage to the affected eye. Using your two fingers, uh, give a firm pressure on the affected eye for 10 to 15 seconds and then release suddenly. This will cause, uh, this is basically to try to dislodge the embolus 
and this, the sudden release may help in propelling the embolus uh, uh, in the distal uh, area, distal uh, part of the CRA. And continue this massage till uh, the paracentesis things are ready. Maybe ask the assistant or the nurse or your colleague to get the paracentesis things ready. Paracentesis can be done either on slit lamp or uh, even on the couch. Uh, do paracentesis and take out about 0.5 cc of aqueous. This is to in order to uh, reduce the pressure in the eye so that again uh, vasodilatation can occur and the embolus can be moved out. Again, continue the massage and breathing in the back. At the same time, you can also now give the sublingual isosorbide dinitrate or apply a nitroglycerin patch or you can give intravenous acetazolamide or intravenous pentoxyphylin. Uh, either you can do all of them or whatever is available in the emergency room. After uh, this exercise is being done for about 15-20 minutes, check the vision of the patient and see whether any improvement is recorded. Also check the fundus quickly to see whether you can see any embolus you know, being sh shifted distally or no. If, uh, if not, if there is no improvement, still continue all these uh, maneuvers, the, the, the breathing and the digital massage can repeat the paracentesis also. Generally, this kind of a treatment can be given for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And I have seen some patient, at least one or two patients I remember who have uh, recovered some vision after say 25 minutes. So it's not a waste of time and surely uh, it can sometimes be helpful. So continue it for nearly about half an hour or even more if you think it will help. So after uh, uh, this... Can we yes. give it uh, using gonio lens now? Uh, yes, you can, use, you can use gonio lens also. Uh, but uh, if, if you don't have the conio lens or if you are you know, trying to arrange, you can just start immediately with the finger. So whatever it is, you need to press on the eye. Uh, conio lens is if you are using, say, on the patient is on the slit lamp and you are doing these procedures, you can use conio lens to press the eye. But I feel that the, the pressure that which you apply with your fingers will be much uh, better and you know, more sustained and strong pressure can be given than with the conio lens. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right. So after these seven steps, the uh, saptapadi, which you have done with the patient, we go to the next management. So while you have the patient in the emergency room, also do a quick physical examination. So check the pulse of the patient. And many times uh, the, the, the pulse itself can give you a lot of uh, guidance. Uh, if you have an irregular pulse, then patient may be having atrial fibrillation. Or if you have absent peripheral pulses, it could be a Takayasu's disease. Or if you have unequal pulses in both arms, it could be some aortic dissection or uh, some such similar problem. Also check the carotid pulses. Sometimes the carotid, uh, there may be you know, unequal pulses on both sides indicating carotid stenosis or there may be bluey. Check the BP because hypertension is a major risk factor. Look for pallor, anemia. Also palpate the temporal artery to look for giant cell arthritis. And then you can order investigations tailored to the patient's particular need. So after having uh, uh, finished this, we'll go on to the anatomy. So why this central adrenal artery is so damaging and why so, so important? Uh, it is because the entire retina is almost single-handedly supplied only by the central adrenal artery. And the central adrenal artery is like an end artery. It does not have any anastomosis with any other arteries. It is a branch of ophthalmic artery, which is again in turn a branch of internal carotid. And uh, the other, uh, other, uh, other branches of the ophthalmic artery, the ciliary arteries, they supply basically the uvea, the ciliary body iris and the choroid. Some part of the retina, that is the outer uh, retina, can get uh, uh, circulation by the choroid by diffusion from the ciliary uh, circulation. However, it is not enough to sustain the retina in the event of a central retinal artery occlusion. So that is why it is most important uh, to act, to act quickly because the central retinal artery leads to severe ischemia, which can cause loss of vision. Now, this is the anatomical uh, uh, you know, uh, depiction uh, where you can see the central retinal artery, which arises from the ophthalmic artery, either as a single trunk or it can be a common trunk with the medial uh, posterior ciliary artery. And then it enters into the dura of the optic nerve, travels into the nerve for some time, and then supplies the retina by entering into the, uh, through the lamina fibrosa into the eye. And now, uh, this, this, was, this is a pioneering work of Dr. Harry, who showed that the, the most uh, common site of central retinal artery occlusion is not actually at the lapina cryprosa as we have been thinking all along. 
but it is at the area where it pierces the dura mater because that is the thinnest portion of the sacroiliac artery and the embolus is most likely to be lodged at this site however a thrombotic occlusion can occur at the lamina cribrosa so both sites are important Uh, uh another important anatomic uh, variation that you must be uh, aware of is the presence of a ciliary retinal artery this is seen in about 15 to 20% of patient and this arises from the ciliary artery the posterior uh, uh, short ciliary artery so it has had it has a different circulation than the central retinal artery and you can see a ciliary retinal artery which is uh, normally on the temporal side uh, typically it will be hooked over the uh, nerve mar- or disc margin Uh, it can supply a small area or it can supply a large area it can supply almost a half of the retina so it varies uh, how much area is supplied by the ciliary retinal artery and it is important because sometimes it can help preserve the vision in certain patients uh, where the central retinal artery gets blocked but the ciliary retinal artery is spared and if you do an ffa you will see the central this ciliary retinal artery filling along with the choroid and earlier than the central retinal artery so retinal artery occlusions you can have the most common being the central retinal artery occlusion which is seen in 60% of times or you can have a branched retinal artery occlusion ciliary retinal artery occlusion or a combined uh, central cro and crvo so we we'll look at them all uh, one by one so coming to the pathogenesis of central retinal artery occlusion Uh, so we, for any vascular occlusion to occur you have to have interplay of three elements this is the virchow's triad which is uh, which you all must be knowing so you need to have a stasis of the blood uh, you need to have endothelial injury and hypercoagulability hypercoagulability so all these three together will lead to vascular occlusion in the uh, in the event of uh, central retinal artery occlusion there are two types uh, of occlusion can occur or that the two mechanisms can be uh, in the play one is because of embolus which is most commonly either from the carotid or from the heart and this is a more common than a thrombus it's nearly seen more than 60% of patients will have an embolus and the site of obstruction as i mentioned just now is at the uh, where the central retinal artery pierces the dura mater however sometimes some emboli are visible in the inside the fundus when you look at when you examine the retina so it's not necessarily right only at that uh, side but can have at other sides also and the second pathogen is second mechanism is due to thrombus formation this is because of atherosclerosis is less common than an embolus but this uh, thrombus formation can occur uh, mainly at the lamina cribrosa so uh, again dr hare has done uh, study and he has shown that this carotid and cardiac uh, diseases a uh, lot of them can lead to crio mainly it can be a carotid occlusion which is very common uh, nearly 55% will have some amount of carotid occlusion and uh, a lot of uh, cardiac uh, diseases mainly the valvular valvular diseases can lead to emboli formation and uh, risk of central retinal artery occlusion the types of emboli can be different the mainly three different types of emboli are seen in crio the most common being cholesterol which are seen in 75% of patients which are refractile yellow orange crystals seen mainly at the bifurcation sites then sometimes you can have calcific uh, emboli which are large dull gray or yellow uh, emboli and cause more severe obstruction or sometimes thrombi are seen which are like platelet fibrin plaque which are again large white um, emboli and we rarely you can have other emboli such as fat bacterial vegetation tumor or amniotic fluid so these are the illustrations of different types of emboli that you can see in crio this is one one of my patients who has got a very nice looking embolus at the uh, uh, bifurcation causing a branched retinal artery occlusion and this is very well seen in this uh, uh, red free photo so causes of retinal artery obstruction are many causes and they differ uh, as per the population that is a young age or old age uh, these are the causes you have seen in the nearly old age that is above 50 years of age uh, most common is the emboli from atheromatous plaque from the carotid arteries uh, you could have emboli which can sometimes be get dislodged during the procedure such as angiography or stenting then you can have either atrial fibrillation valvular diseases bacterial endocarditis diabetes hypertension hyperlipidemia smoking is a risk factor thrombophilia and various types of vasculitis or you can have tumors such as leukemia lymphoma drugs such as oral contraceptive pills and cocaine 
uh, trauma, raised intraocular pressure, uh, retrovulvar injections, intraocular gas injection, hemodialysis, and other miscellaneous causes. Uh, an equally long list is there for uh, uh, causes which can lead to retinal artery occlusion in the young patients. Uh, what is more important that uh, these causes are slightly different. Uh, again, you have oral contraceptives, you have hemoglobinopathies, and you have coagulopathies. Uh, so this is actually reported by the Western literature. Uh, in Indian population, when we did a study, we found that the causes were slightly different. And what we found that in India patient, the most common cause of uh, CRAO in young patient was actually hyperhomocysteinemia, which is the uh, main cause for the hypercoagulability. And the other causes which were reported in the Western literature, such as coagulation disorders, oral contraceptive pills, or the hemoglobinopathies were much less in the Indian population. So how does this homocysteine lead to vascular occlusion? So homocysteine is toxic and it can cause both arterial as well as venous occlusions. It can cause strokes, etc. So we have to be aware of this homocysteine. Uh, homocysteine is metabolized by two pathways. One is the methylation pathway where it is converted to methionine. And this is uh, this requires methionine synthesis as well as the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme and uh, vitamin B12. And another pathway is the transfer sulfuration pathway, which again in the presence of vitamin B6, the homocysteine is converted to cystathione. Now, due to various reasons such as uh, either vitamin deficiencies or the enzyme uh, malfunction, the homocysteine does not get degraded and gets collected into the blood and leads to hyperhomocysteinemia. This raised homocysteine is, can cause uh, all of these uh, problems uh, that is the, from the Virchow's triad. So you can have atherosclerosis because of the ROS or the H2O2 pathway. Uh, you can have a reduced nitric oxide and that can lead to endothelial cell damage. And homocysteine can also lead to other this coagulation malfunction and leading to a prothrombotic state. So homo raised homocysteine leads to predisposes a patient to vascular occlusions. So these are the various causes where you will see raised plasma homocysteine, uh, mainly some genetic factors which, uh, which are involved in the enzyme uh, function. Or you can have nutritional factors such as folate deficiency, vitamin B6, B12 deficiency, which is very common in India because of malnutrition and uh, as such. Sometimes excessive intake of methionine, which is a high protein diet, which is now sometimes now you have this fad of taking only proteins and no carbs, etc can uh, you know predispose a patient to have excessive methionine and homocysteine uh, drugs such as uh, alcohol tobacco and caffeine also lead to increase homocysteine and methotrexate cyclosporine and some anticonvulsants other factors are increasing age male gender white race and postmenopausal ladies and some of the chronic diseases listed here can also lead to high high, high homocysteine uh, some uh, a short note about this uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. So the point mutation in this uh, uh, gene which uh, encodes for uh, this MTHFR enzyme can lead to uh, a uh, malfunctioning of this uh, enzyme. So this enzyme is a very thermolabile and can get affected very easily. Generally a homogeneous TT genotype uh, can lead to malfunction but even a heterogeneous can also cause. And in the presence of dietary deficiency of folate, this leads to hyperhomocysteinemia. So sometimes it is worthwhile to check for this MTHFR uh, gene in certain young patients who, uh, who may, whom you may suspect uh, to have this gene problem. Off late, a very new and novel uh, cause uh, we saw in the last uh, one or two years in the pandemic. And that is because of the SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID-19 disease. And there are many cases and in fact increased cases of both CRAO as well as CRAO, CRBO we are seen in this pandemic and this is because of virus induced coagulopathy and various pathogenesis were put forward uh, by various uh, groups. Uh, some, some thought that it was because of excessive inflammation by the disease causing endothelial damage, platelet activation and stasis or it could be also because of elevated D-dimer levels leading to thrombocytopenia, hypercoagulability, prolongation of prothrombin time, and high fibrinogen levels, and microvascular thrombosis. Some people thought that it was because of cytokine storm. However, uh, we are not certain about exactly how, what is the pathogenesis of these uh, vascular occlusions, but it was seen in both mild cases as well as patients who had a severe COVID disease. I'm sorry for the typo. Uh, both mild as well as severe COVID-19 disease. 
so once the once the ciliary once the central retinal artery occlusion occurs it leads to you know the stoppage of the capillary flow and leading to axoplasmic stasis and intracellular edema with ischemic necrosis of the inner retina and this is what causes the opacification of the inner retina which we see most commonly at the posterior pole because of the dense uh, nerve fiber layer there or the increased thickness uh, however it is also present in the periphery of the retina although it might not be visible but the central retinal artery occlusion affects both the central as well as the peripheral retina and you see the typical cherry red spot which is a red looking red appearance of the fovea uh, that is uh, uh, because of the contrast from the surrounding opacification and also because of the rp and the choroid which shines through the fovea so uh, crao types uh, classification has been proposed by dr hare and uh, with his studies he has shown that it can be classified based on the pathogenesis Uh, it is uh, classified into four types one is a non arthritic permanent type or it could be a non arthritic transient type uh, and the fourth uh, third variety is a non arthritic with ciliary retinal artery sparing and the fourth is an arthritic type so we we'll look at this the most common variety is the non arthritic permanent crao and this is seen in nearly two third of the cases the more it is more common to have an embolus in this type of variety rather than a thrombosis and this leads to permanent occlusion of the central retinal artery occlusion the uh, central retinal artery because of the embolus uh, this is of course be, uh, can be secondary to either carotid or cardiac disease uh, rarely it could be because of either vasculitis or immune disorders or thrombophilia most patients will have a very poor visual uh, vision near county fingers or even worse but some patients uh, may have about uh, 2200 or 2400 vision in this uh, type of crao the second variety is the transient non arthritic crao uh, this is seen in about 15 to 17% of patients and this has got the best prognosis uh, this can happen because of either transient impaction of an embolus or because of a, a fall of perfusion pressure below the critical level or because of either fall in the blood pressure or raised intraocular pressure or it could be because of a transient vasospasm due to serotonin release from platelets on an atherosclerotic plaque this occlusion is seen to last from several minutes to several hours and uh, it it could also be because of some migrating embolus such as a platelet fibrin embolus this is analogous to the tia which you observe in the cerebral stroke and uh, the clinical appearance uh, vision outcome uh, is almost same in other varieties of crao but the visual acuity can be a little bit better uh, in about 38% of patients in 38% it is seen to be uh, nearly counting fingers or worse Uh, another variety is a non arthritic uh, central retinal artery occlusion with ciliary retinal artery sparing so this can occur in patients where the ciliary retinal artery is present in about uh, 50% of patients and the ciliary retinal artery because it has got a separate uh, supply does not get blocked uh, and thus it spares some amount of retina uh, vision may be uh, good depending on uh, how much of the area uh, or whether the macula is supplied by the ciliary retinal artery or no and sometimes it may may not be uh, possible and the macula may still be ischemic with a poor vision despite a ciliary retinal artery sparing and the fourth variety is the arthritic crao uh, this is rare variety and it occurs only about 4.5% of cases and it is even rarer in india so this is generally uh, seen uh, uh, in association with giant cell arthritis and occurs because of thrombosis of the common trunk of the posterior ciliary artery as well as the central retinal artery and that is why an nffa is diagnostic in this cases uh, we will see uh, later in the talk uh, this uh, this has got a very poor prognosis and also the vision is also very poor sometimes you may also have no pl in nearly about 54% of uh, such cases giant cell arthritis a short note about giant cell arthritis uh, this is a disease of medium sized and large arteries and not of arterioles and that is why you have the occlusion of the common trunk of the posterior ciliary artery and the cra uh, this is uh, this can also be associated with uh, ischemic optic neuropathy and ciliary artery occlusion ciliary retinal artery occlusion ffa is diagnostic because it shows you the occlusion of the posterior ciliary artery and this is a this is a uh, again a ophthalmic emergency because this needs to be uh, identified and diagnosed correctly in order to prevent vision loss in the other eye the risk of a similar thing happening in the other eye is very high and it can be prevented if the patient is treated immediately with intravenous steroids
so once you have uh, uh, diagnosed and managed the emergency situation you can order a few ocular investigations Uh, the, uh, so these investigations are uh, FFA, OCT, Humphrey visual fields, and electroretinogram. Uh, among this, the uh, I would say probably FFA is the most important, and it should be performed in almost all eyes of CRO, basically to distinguish between the types of CRO and to assess the extent of the of ischemia and the residual uh, circulation of the retina. Uh, and sometimes it may also help in detecting neovascularization which may be seen in a few cases uh, after 2 to 16 weeks in acute cases of cro you will see that uh, uh, in a, in non arteritic cro there will be normal choroidal filling but in arteritic cro you will have delayed choroidal filling because of the posterior ciliary artery occlusion uh, if you have a ciliary retinal artery which is spared then that will fill during the choroidal phase and that can be seen Uh, but the diagnostic uh, sign is a delayed retinal filling that is the arm to retina time that i will come to it in a minute uh, rest of the area i will show hypofluorescence and sometimes you will have late leakage if there is neovascularization in case the, of a late cro that means if the patient has had cro long back and you are now seeing follow up the patient will have restored cir retinal circulation except for the delayed arm to retina time so this arm to retina time is the most important thing that you would note in an ffa of a central retinal artery occlusion uh, the arm to retina time is the time time taken by the dye to reach the retinal circulation after it is injected into the anticubital vein now this is calculated from the moment the injection is given till its first appearance in the central retinal artery so normal time is about 8 to 12 seconds that is just 1 second after the choroidal flush but uh, in cro the delay the arm to retina time can be delayed to more than 20 seconds sometimes even 30 seconds or even beyond so uh, this can be seen even after the recirculation has been established that means even if you are seeing the patient after many weeks or many months you may still note the delayed arm to retina time however there are some few uh, points uh, which need to be kept in mind that the dye needs to be injected as rapidly as a bolus and uh, the timer has to be started correctly uh, as as soon as you are giving the injection and the initial photos have to be taken very rapidly in succ in succession so as not to miss the exact time of the appearance of the dye in the eye so this is one uh, patient of uh, basically he had a proliferative diabetic retinopathy and had undergone uh, laser photocoagulation but he presented with a central retinal artery occlusion and you can see that there is a cherry red spot and opacification around the macular area and so the ffa was done the, you, you see a lot of uh, uh, frames with no dye at all and here at i think around 33 seconds you see the dye entering entering into the central lateral artery uh, some vessels are filled and these veins are still empty there is also a prolonged ap transit time and uh, basically very sluggish circulation quite a hypofluorescent uh, retina and some amount of uh, disc staining in the very late stages OCT also can be performed. Uh, however, it is more of an academic interest than uh, any other uh, reason because it does not help much in uh, either the diagnosis or the management. However, if you do if you do perform OCT, it will show you uh, uh, in the in the acute case it will show you a very high reflective inner retinal layer and a very low reflective outer retinal layer and the prominent middle limiting layer will middle limiting membrane will be seen. in case of late cro you would see uh, atrophy of the retina with thinning of the retina and one interesting uh, oct feature has been noted by a few researchers that is optical intensity ratio which is nothing but the ratio of the intensity of the inner layers versus the outer layers and this can sometimes say help you in prognosis uh, however i don't think it is that much necessary uh, prognosis is quite uh, you know clear for you to see Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, these with academic interest you can try all these things ocd angiography also is again purely academic and uh, research it is not necessary to perform in all patients but if you do perform then in acute stage it, it will you will see that there is a marked disruption of both superficial capillary plexus as well as the deep capillary plexus and uh, the, 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 there is decreased vascular perfusion probably also because of the sluggish uh, blood flow it may not be picked up on the ocd very well ocd a very well and in chronic cases also you will see a decreased flow in both the plexuses visual fields can be charted if the patient's vision allows that uh, prominently you will see a central scotoma with a peripheral field defect in the initial stages however eventually some recovery of the peripheral fields can occur 
uh, but the central defect may remain. So this is basically seen in non-arthritic CRO. In arthritic CRO, you do not expect much uh, improvement. Uh, but however, it is seen, it is noted that uh, this does not affect the day-to-day -day life much because uh, with the peripheral field, the patient may have a fairly good quality of life. ERG again is uh, not a mandatory investigation to be done. Uh, again, more of an interest uh, if you want to do. Uh, it can show you electronegative, unilateral electronegative ERG where the P wave is reduced, but the A wave is almost preserved or only minimally reduced. It can sometimes help you in differentiating from ophthalmic artery occlusion, which will show you attenuation of both A and B waves due to global ischemia. Some studies have shown a correlation of B wave amplitude, D by A ratio, and the PHNR, that is photopic negative response, with degree of ischemia and possibility of visual recovery. Again, it is purely academic and not uh, really necessary clinically. So after uh, having done this, we come to the systemic workup of a patient of with central adrenal artery occlusion. So the, as I said, the systemic workup can be tailored to the particular patient, uh, depending on what you suspect in that patient. Uh, the medical problems, the medications, the eye diseases can guide you as to what uh, might be the possible cause in such a patient. Check the blood pressure and can order uh, the routine blood test can be done, such which will include fasting blood sugar, glycosylated hemoglobin, complete blood count, differential count, uh, as well as platelets and the other coagulation profile. Uh, ESR is very important. Lipid profile, homocysteine estimation, ANA and the syphilis profile can be done. What is most important is that the patient should undergo a complete medical evaluation with careful attention to cardiovascular disease or hypercoagulability. A uh, patient must have an echocardiography and carotid and vertebral doppler. And it is important that you refer the patient to an internist uh, or a cardiologist for proper evaluation uh, with a letter stating why, what is the need for, what is the reason for the uh, referral because uh, sometimes uh, the patient may be completely normal with no history of cardiovascular disease and the, the, you know, the internist might be wondering why the patient has been referred if the patient doesn't uh, volunteer with the history. Uh, other uh, investigations, especially in young patients, would be hemoglobin electrophoresis, cryoglobulins, coagulation profile, then uh, lipoprotein A, antiphospholipid, lupus anticoagulant, and uh, a big list of investigations can be provided. But as I said, you can tailor it to the particular uh, patient's requirement. So how does the CRO progress once the central retinal artery occlusion is seen? What happens to the retina in the, as the retina recovers? So you would see that the retinal opacification starts disappearing as the CRO starts recovering. Not that the, uh, the ischemia, only the opacification goes away, but the ischemic damage remains. So by one month, you will see that the retinal opacification has disappeared. Uh, the arterial attenuation uh, can be seen in about 58% of patients, but in some patients, the arteries also may look normal. Uh, in about, by about three months, the optic atrophy will set in and about 90% of patients will show optic atrophy but 10% uh, of patients may show even a normal looking disc. Celioretinal collaterals will be seen in nearly about 18% of patients. And uh, over a period of time, again, pigmentary changes will develop in the macula. So sometimes uh, unless you see the retina carefully, you will not uh, realize that the patient has had a CRAO and there, there may be very subtle changes, but the vision may be quite reduced. So a high degree of suspicion is necessary to diagnose CRAO in very late chronic stages. So factors which determine visual prognosis in central retinal artery occlusion, the most important being the duration of retinal ischemia. Uh, retina has a very high demand for oxygenation and as such, the tolerance for ischemia is very low. And so retina tends to uh, you know, lose its uh, strength very quickly when it becomes ischemic. So complete recovery can occur if the ischemia is reversed within 90 minutes. And this is all from Dr. Harris' experiments. He saw that in, within 90 minutes, if the reperfusion has started, then the complete function of the retina can be recovered. Some improvement is possible if the, if the reperfusion occurs within 240 minutes, that is four hours. But beyond that, irreversible and massive damage occurs. So you have a very short window period for any of the treatment uh, modalities to be uh, done. So whatever you need to do, it has to be done within that window period. So hence, the very, very importance of uh, emergency management and em immediate, immediate referral. Uh, other uh, other factor which determines visual prognosis is the type of CRO. Uh, as I mentioned before, the transient non-arthritic non, non CRO has the best improvement chance. 
that it can improve by about 82 percent uh, the non arteritic cro can with ciliaretinal artery sparing also can improve nearly by 60 to 70 uh, percent the non arteritic can improve by 22 percent and the arteritic there is no improvement possible so it is important to note the type of cro and based on that you can expect some improvement uh, in about a few weeks by about uh, three to four weeks so uh, after having uh, done that uh, as i told you in the beginning uh, the acute management of central atrial artery occlusion is the most important and the goal of the acute treatment is to dislodge the embolus to reduce the intraocular pressure so as the uh, to increase the perfusion of the uh, eye uh, vasodilation again can help in increasing the retinal blood flow and to maintain the retinal oxygenation now there are some other various other treatments uh, some of them experimental treatments have been uh, tried uh, in these patients and some of them one of them being the hyperbaric oxygen so hyperbaric oxygen is nothing but a mixture of 95 percent oxygen with five percent carbon dioxide that is a very high oxygen content which is given to the patient so as to cause vasodilation in the uh, vessels so this is this uh, basically the hyperbaric oxygen preserves the retina in a very oxygenated state till the recanalization and reperfusion is established which is can take up to 72 hours and uh, because of this high oxygen uh, content it is possible that the retina can recover from the ischemia so uh, however there are a lot of other side effects of this uh, hyperbaric oxygen and it is not always uh, feasible to give this uh, treatment some centers may have it available most of the centers do not have uh, another uh, experimental treatment which has been tried is the ndag laser for the embolus the NDAG laser arteriotomy. Here, here the YAG laser is used to dissolve the embolus and release the block. And it is the care has to be taken to focus the laser deep to the arterial wall so that you do not rupture the arterial wall. However, a great risk of rupture and bleeding does exist. And a few uh, isolated case reports involving just one or two patients have been published. However, uh, I am not aware of anybody who does this as a routine management of CRO. Other treatments are steroids, especially if you are uh, suspecting an arteritic CRO, uh, you need to give intravenous st steroids immediately as soon as you suspect uh, and then continue the further management. Sometimes anticoagulants can be given, but these are basically reserved for patients who, who are known to suffer from hypercoagulable states, atrial fibrillation, etc. The main goal of anticoagulants is basically to prevent secondary vascular occlusions such as cerebral infarction or the involvement of the other eye. Uh, what about uh, thrombolysis? So this has also been uh, uh, you know, uh, assessed by various uh, groups and there was one study called EGLE study that is a European assessment group for lysis in the eye. This was a randomized multi-center study which was done to look at the results of thrombolysis. But uh, in short, I will tell you that the result was uh, that the lysis does not help and neither intra-arterial or intravenous thrombosis, thrombolysis uh, helps much in improving the vision. So all streptokinase, urokinase, or even TPA did not help. And moreover, this is associated with a high morbidity. And it can also it can only be done in very higher centers where you have the intervention radiology setup. And, it should, and most important is that it has to be performed within six hours to be effective. Otherwise, there is no point in doing this uh, highly, highly risky procedure. How should you follow up a patient who has central retinal artery occlusion? Uh, basically, you need to follow up the patient after three to four weeks, weeks to look for new vascularization. And again, after a month to look for any NBI. Uh, once the blood reports are ready, do not forget to review the patient and to review the blood reports to look for any possible causes. And appropriate uh, you know, referral to appropriate specialist uh, should be done in a timely manner. So, so one uh, important thing is sometimes the ciliaretinal uh, shunt vessels will develop on the disc which should not be confused with the new vessels so that is why this important photo here prognosis so the vision remains stable after the central retinal artery occlusion has occurred unless the patient develops secondary complications such as nbg uh, however nbg is rare in cro and uh, does not uh, is not seen in a normal cro but if it is associated with say other element of ciliary artery occlusion also then you might end up with a, the patient might end up with an nbg but the most important is that the risk of cerebral stroke is very high and the life expectancy after a cro is seen to be only 5.5 years compared to a 15.4 years for a normal age matched population similarly the mortality rate is also high 
uh, especially for patients with visible emboli, the mortality rate is 56% compared to 27% uh, over the next nine years uh, in an age match population. So it is very, very important that these patients are referred to an internist for or a neurologist or a cardiologist for proper evaluation. And mm -hmm. so, you know, proper therapy can be started in case the patient is found to have further uh, risk for this uh, cerebral stroke or myocardial infarction. So most important is prevention. Prevention means uh, prevents from the other eye being affected or other vascular occlusions being there. Or what first aid that you can ask the patient to do in case the patient does have uh, you know, symptoms in the other eye. So one of the important uh, signs is the amaurosis fugax, uh, which, uh, which is basically a transient visual loss, which lasts for a few seconds and then patient recovers the full vision. These are warning signs and patients should be informed that this can indicate uh, you know, risk of CRAO occurring uh, in the other eye or even you know, not. So this needs to be evaluated thoroughly. So such patients uh, should not be, you know, you should not uh, neglect this uh, amaurosis fugax symptom and you should uh, send this patient for uh, proper evaluation including eco, carotid, doppler, etc. and look for any potential risk factors. Uh, a possibility of CRAO occurring in the other eye is uh, very much there and patient must be explained uh, that this possibility is there and they should take some first aid measures. So I always make it a point to explain to the patient uh, because uh, you know already the CRAO has happened in one eye and there's nothing much you can do to improve the vision in that eye. But, but you can always educate the patient that how he can save his other eye in case he does get uh, a problem in the other eye. So inform the patient that in case he does see any uh, decreased vision in the other eye and does not improve in a few minutes, he should immediately start this ocular massage himself, can start breathing in a bag. Uh, they can also use some sublingual sorbitrate or they can put a nitroglycerin patch anywhere on the skin, which will immediately lead to vasodilatation. And they must rush to an ophthalmologist immediately without any delay. So that brings us to other retinal artery occlusions. Uh, this is in very brief, I'm going to cover this. So the most important is the branch retinal artery occlusion. So this, as the name indicates, it involves only a branch of the central retinal artery occlusion. And this is nearly seen, seen in nearly 35% of patients. So you will see an opacification in the distribution uh, of that particular uh, branch. Uh, sometimes the vision may be good if the macula is not involved, but uh, vision may be bad if the macula is involved in that, uh, that uh, particular branch. So this is, this is generally because of embolus, which causes permanent occlusion of the branch. Celioretinal artery occlusion can occur independently from the central retinal artery occlusion. And uh, normally it can be a non arteritic uh, celioretinal artery occlusion alone, which is seen uh, with good visual prognosis uh, if it does not affect a large area. Uh, you can also have an arteritic celioretinal artery occlusion, which is associated with uh, giant cell arteritis, which has got a very poor prognosis. Or you can have uh, in association with CRVO, which is the much, much common variety to be seen. The hemi central retinal artery occlusion can occur, which is a term applied to a, a problem where either the superior or the inferior trunk of the uh, celiac retinal artery is uh, blocked. So this blockage can be seen either at the lamina cribrosa or just behind lamina cribrosa where the, the central retinal artery branches. And typically you will see the opacification involving the half of the retina, either superior or the inferior. So the rest of the management, the investigations, etc., for all these varieties remains the same as uh, central retinal artery occlusion, uh, except that the, the visual, visual prognosis depends on the uh, area involved. Another entity which you see is the combined central retinal artery occlusion as well as central retinal vein occlusion. And this is a very interesting uh, entity because here the central retinal artery occlusion is not because of any embolus or thrombus, but it is because of hemodynamic blockage, which can occur because of back, uh, you know, stag stagnation of the uh, blood column into the capillaries. So when central retinal vein occlusion occurs, the, the blood gets stagnated in the vein as well as in the capillaries and the blood has nowhere to go. So as a back pressure builds up and that causes the secondary central retinal artery occlusion. So what you will see is that uh, a similar picture like CRA, CRBO with some little bit of vascular dilatation and tortuosity, but you will have much less uh, uh, hemorrhages than you see in a normal CRBO. And you will see this kind of retinal opacification and this might be pale. A cherry red spot uh, may may not be present. 
uh, in this situation the visual improve visual prognosis is very poor uh, most often it will be just hand movements or even less and uh, so this is the ffa of a combined crio crvo you can see that there is a gross uh, ischemia uh, it shows delayed die entry delayed av transit time and uh, uh, pruning of the mid sized retinal artery so this has got very high risk of nvg so nearly about 80% of patients will develop uh, rubiosis iridis and nvg with a very poor prognosis the eye can be lost aggressive management is uh, required with panretinal photocoagulation so the take home points uh, central retinal artery occlusion is a true emergency and treatment should be instituted within 90 minutes if possible irreversible damage can occur and loss of vision can occur if uh, beyond 240 minutes so again time is of essence cherry red spot is diagnostic along with delayed arm retina time in ffa treatment should be attempted till 24 hours later even if the patient presents uh, late because there is sometimes there is a chance that you may recover some vision Spontaneous recovery the can occur although, and atherosclerosis and embolism are the main causes in the elderly. And in young patients, mainly look for hyperlipidemia or other causes of hypercoagulable conditions. So I would like to thank you for your uh, patient listening, and I would like to acknowledge the help of Dr. Snehal Bawaskar in preparing of this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dhanushree, for a uh, truly illuminating talk, I must say. I think all the listeners, uh, including us, I think benefited quite a bit. So before I think all of us react, I would give first chance to all these, these uh, you know, our uh, postgraduates and, uh, you know, people who are in the hot seats to clarify their doubts uh, before any of us, any one of us, uh, you know, has any comment. Yes, Rolika. Let's take uh, questions from the... Sir, Anurag has a question. So, Anurag, would you like to take the question <laughs> yourself or you would like me to ask? Why don't you come online and ask the question? Because I want very... It's very important that you see uh, these uh, 10 people, they should clarify their doubts first. Yes. Yes, Anurag. Okay. Ralika, you can read out if Anurag is yeah. not there. Anurag, He's are you there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Uh, Ma'am, uh, ma how will cellular retinal collateral development influence development of optic atrophy in the course of this year? Uh, yeah, good evening, Anurag. That is a very nice question. And I'm sorry, I could not see the chat box during presentation. Uh, otherwise, I would have replied earlier. But uh, however, your doubt is very pertinent that whether the cellular retinal collaterals will affect the optic atrophy. Uh, but no, the cellular retinal uh, collaterals uh, uh, will not have any effect on the optic atrophy because the cellular retinal uh, collaterals are basically bypassing the you know the vessel the optic nerve circulation. So it is basically a connection between the ciliary circulation and the central retinal artery circulation. The optic atrophy occurs because of the loss of the uh, capillaries, in the basically the radial peripapillary capillaries, which are lost in central retinal artery occlusion. And as a result, that causes optic atrophy. So even if you have the collaterals, the optic atrophy is still might. Thank yes, you, Rodiga, Other questions, Rolika? Yeah, Rolika, you Yes, sir. Suni, would you like to ask your questions or should I go ahead? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, ma can CRAO episode abort by itself uh, and how uh, how we should suspect uh, when the patient presents with some visual, uh, bad visual acuity in the department? Uh, so that is what is Dr. Dr. Harry has described as transient uh, CRAO. So transient CRO is basically a variety of CRO where the occlusion has been there just for a transient period uh, due to some reason. Uh, most commonly, it is because of some vasospasm. And uh, as a result, the spasm will be there and that much amount of time, the, you know, the, the perfusion might be affected. But the spasm may get relieved and the perfusion may get re-established. So as a result, the transient nature of the CRO is relieved and you may have a re-perfusion. So this is a particular entity where you will have good visual prognosis. But uh, uh, what signs to suspect would be based on the visual acuity, uh, based on your uh, reperfusion, you can do a uh, fluorescein angiograph and look at the arm to retina time. That is the most important. And look at the entire circulation. So that would give you an idea whether this is a permanent block or this is a kind of a transient block. But the Sony, uh, you know, it is more pertinent that apart from this, what is called amylosis fugax or uh, you know, this still needs to be investigated from the point of view of uh, the reasons which uh, Dhanishri had told. 
you see even though it may be only a spasm and patient is lucky to you know get relief but that does not absolve us of, uh, of the responsibility to investigate also no dhanushree yes very correct sir very correct and also the second question which dr soni has written in the chat box is also very pertinent whether the arterial occlusions can present with other chronic forms of vision problem so definitely it can present as i showed you one patient with the pdr who had undergone some laser etc and all and then presented in fact that patient had a bilateral crio he presented first with one eye crio and then he came with the second eye crio after 3 4 months so it can present with other uh, pathologies and uh, whether you should investigate such a patient say supposing you already know that patient has cardiovascular disease or patient has some other uh, uh, say some kind of uh, sickle cell or something should you or should you not investigate such a patient if they happen to have crio so it has been seen that patients uh, uh, who who had crio when they were investigated nearly 64% of patients they found a new risk factor so it is not necessary that if you have one risk factor and then you think that this is the risk factor for crio uh, definitely you must make an attempt to investigate the patient further to look for any other novel risk factors thank you ma'am yeah thank any you, question rolika yes i think uh, piyushi has a question yeah piyushi please come forward uh, good evening ma'am uh, ma'am my ma question was uh, recently in uh, uh, rhino orbital mucormycosis cases lot of uh, crio cases we have seen and uh, most of these cases had actually undergone bilateral fes and uh, orbitotomy so like after uh, undergoing uh, such extensive operation and then when they are presenting with crio should we like go ahead with our ocular massage and the regular uh, emergency treatment for crio or what should be our uh, approach to these uh, cases yeah very uh, very interesting question and uh, unfortunately i have not come across any such a scenario in real life but uh, if you think of the you know the say central lateral artery occlusion is going to make the patient blind so the loss of vision is uh, much uh, you know very much uh, it is a very severe loss of vision and sometimes it can be prevented if you do give this uh, first aid uh, treatment so if the if uh, unless the patient has some open wound or something which is going to cause a problem if you give the digital massage etc Uh, i don't think there is any harm in doing this paracentesis or digital massage etc which is described or at least give some vasodilators and you know other measures to avoid the permanent uh, block from occurring so you see the, the maybe that most of these patients of mucor mycosis with the cra are so bad so bad that ultimately you have to you know uh, pay attention to life saving measures and excentration and mm-hmm. other things rather yes. than massage at that time does not occur but in any yes, case if it's a mild uh, you see a uh, mild uh, affection uh, by mucor mycosis then obviously go ahead and you know do my years what dhanishree uh, yes dinesh you wanted to say something thank you i think yeah, think yeah please yeah yeah any other question please yes because sir. my main issue was to solve the queries by the by the the front benchers i think ritesh wanted to say something yeah we will come to ritesh that, and that ritesh. question Yeah. So, if there's no other question, yes, Ritesh, please carry on with your comment or question. Ritesh, R- Rolika has a question, I think. No, no, sir. I have questions, but please go ahead and complete. So what I was saying was, if uh, as Piyushi was saying, if, if the surgeon has done face and has decompressed the orbit, and in spite of that, also patient has later on developed a CRO in a COVID patient, need to. you have muted your huh? sorry so as i was saying if the surgeon has done uh, face and decompress the orbit is still the patient is developing crio as dr dhanashree said thromboembolic part of um, covid also needs to be considered and if that is the situation all your massage and emergency medicines may have a role but if it's an orbital compression which has not been properly relieved or which has not been cleared off then it is predominantly an orbital uh, clearing which would be required more than uh, a massage that's what i just want so if there's that. a proptosis the approach is different if there's no proptosis yeah, yeah. correct correct directly put can i just add something there are yeah, yeah. a pathology study that has been published where excentrated specimens were evaluated for central lateral artery and all of them 
had a complete occlusion of central retinal artery some even with ophthalmic artery because of infiltration fungal filament actually infiltrating and earlier we thought it was microangiopathy and that was ruled out on the histopathology report so it is infiltrative so there is hardly any chance of recovery of vision once there is cri into the lumen or into the wall into the lumen as well sir okay initially it, it happens in the wall and the endothelial cell lining and then it finally becomes so severe that the entire lumen gets occluded so that means dr santosh practically a cro in a mucor mycosis is uh, is a end of a visual potential for that that's right bye thank Any you so much yes jolika yes sir so uh, ma'am we have a question that uh, from facebook i believe that does massage and paracentesis uh, do they work in thrombotic cro as well so uh, see uh, if there is a if this is a debatable question you can say whether it really works or not because uh, if you do this kind of measures in say about 100 patients uh, very few patients will show recovery so uh, it is uh, but uh, what i am going to say is that every patient is uh, important and you must try it for every patient so you never know sometimes even a thrombotic patient can also recover so although i showed you all the percentages of recovery in various types of uh, cro uh, but when a patient is there in emergency you don't know which patient which type it is and which one is going to recover so i would suggest that uh, whatever the type of cro if you are in the emergency and if the patient has come to you within 90 minutes of uh, uh, having a cro you must try you must give it your best shot and must try all this digital massage and all the all the other uh, treatments to try and improve some vision jolika once the patient presents uh, most of the times uh, we are not able to make out you see the thrombus or embolus therefore it is mandatory to institute all emergency measures statistically speaking if you do a retro analysis the help is most with the embolus because it's a small thing which can move from a relatively uh, important area to unimportant area the thrombus uh, being a size may be so difficult to move that thrombus but nevertheless uh, measures have to be taken in the emergency room always always right so i think at that time you would be able to be sure that you're dealing with a thrombus or an embolus except yeah. in some cases so if you're yeah. so either way yeah, un- unless yeah. unless an embolus is visible unless an embolus is visible you do not know whether it is thrombus or embolus so let's try it. Any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, there is a question, ma'am. That is there any clinical way of differentiating an embolus at the optic nerve sheath level or from an embolus at the lamina cribrosa level? And does the management change in any way? So clinically, it is not possible unless you unless the embolus is visible when you are doing the fundoscopy. So in ophthalmoscopy, sometimes you may find the embolus at the bifurcation or somewhere along the trunk. Uh, in that case, only you can see uh, you can say that this is the site of embolus. But uh, if the embolus is not visible, then you do not know where along the course of the CRO CRO that the embolus might be. but this is been shown by dr harris studies in the animals and in uh, human uh, subjects where he has shown that the most like the most uh, narrow part of the central retinal artery is where it penetrates the dural sheath of the optic nerve so it is likely that that is a part where which can get occluded most by an embolus uh, if if you want you can probably do uh, you know arteriography or you know mr angiography etc and try and localize but it's highly difficult to exactly pinpoint the site of occlusion you see a lot of uh, studies of thrombolytic i think dhanushree pointed out thrombotherapy have uh, eagle study she pointed out in fact i have seen surgeons you know doing the uh, cannulation up to the thalamic artery and trying to say but generally most of them these uh, procedures do not do not uh, help except episodic case report may other thing dhanushree i wanted to ask there has been some hue and cry raised about this vitre surgery uh, by uh, you know couple of our indian colleagues also from mumbai uh nishikant borse has been propagating beyond you see what you said critical time of say uh, 240 minutes or maybe maybe uh, you know one day uh what is uh, your uh, take on that uh yeah sir actually i don't have any personal experience because i have not done even a single such surgery so but i have seen the nishikant's video and what uh, he has presented 
uh, what what i say what i say is that probably there might be some few lucky patients which may get uh, benefited by this kind of uh, surgery but uh, you need to consider the risk of the surgery as that is uh, there is definitely risk of bleeding and uh, many times even if you do try this kind of maneuvers uh, the patient may not benefit especially if that window period of the 240 minutes is over so i really don't think uh, i might not subject a patient to such a surgery if uh, you know if the patient has already had this uh, cro but uh, it's very and, difficult and for me to comment because yeah yeah i know yes, and yes, what those seven steps uh, what you showed in the first slide itself those are very very important and would you lay down any critical uh, limit that beyond this you should not do it beyond or all patients you know a lot of these patients come late to us also because it's very yes. lucky for the patient and for lucky for us also that patients yes. comes within uh, you know this time what is the so, critical uh, yes i went through some literature and it is advocated that uh, you must try all this procedure till 24 hours so okay. so even if the patient has come to you say the next day after having developed cro but for 24 hours you can give the benefit of doubt to the patient and can try all these measures uh, sometimes they may help but uh, ideal period would be within 90 minutes if the patient has come within 90 minutes then there should be no delay in instituting treatment and you should you know go all out uh, all you know all measures should be done and would you advocate this sudden paracentesis to be done uh, within the opd or you want to take him to or immediate because time is of sense uh, yes sir you know i i would advise uh, in the opd in fact in the emergency room itself so yeah. if you have the slit lamp you do it on the slit lamp if there is no slit lamp uh, don't bother just do it on the couch so uh, I, i would not wait for any more uh, of course uh, make sure that you maintain the sterility and then do yeah. the paracentesis otherwise you would end up with uh, further problems of end of thermitis yeah a few comments from dinesh yeah i had three four comments uh, actually one is that when you when the patient presents to you the fact is that the cherry red spot takes 5 to 6 hours to develop so actually because that is because of the stoppage of axial plasmic flow the earliest sign which you will get and that is which is missed by all of us is actually cattle trucking mm. because in the first thing when the flow gets uh, stopped there'll be back and forth movement and that is the earliest sign and at that time there is no cherry red spot so when a patient presents within the first hour or so with a sudden loss of vision the only sign you're going to have is actually cattle trucking there is one more sign which is less uh, more difficult to elicit and that is that when you try to do um, a compression of the artery you won't be able to compress it it won't because it's already blocked so it's already got stagnant flow it won't get blocked so so when there is difficulty in causing that blockage that's a secondary point but the first point is cattle trucking so this is very important that just because there is no cherry red spot don't think you don't have a in fact my biggest problem has been the patients who came to me gave a history that they were actually seen within a few hour, within an hour or two but at that time nothing was done and by the next day when they came to me they already had a cherry red spot so it's not that their cherry red spot was missed it's just that it was not there at that time so Next that time, yeah. the Next first one that critical 2 3 hours 4 hours because after that it will develop the second important thing is uh, the second thing i wanted to talk about was about hyperbaric oxygen that's another thing which is coming up and there are anecdotal reports my okay. personal experience of two cases one responded one did not but the one which did not respond actually got the treatment after four days and you have to try to initiate it within 24 hours if it, if it has to be successful ideally of course within a few hours but 24 hours supposed to be a reasonable limit to, to start the treatment i think darius has one case where he reported that it worked for them within 24 See, hours. Uh, Dinesh, I would still hyperbaric the seven steps which Dhanushri had listed. No, all those have to be done. Yeah. All yeah. those have to be done. But yeah. this is the next step after that. See, you're not going to do hyperbaric oxygen at night. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, the yeah. patient will be going the next day. It is, a, it is yeah. done in the hospital setting only. But yeah. you do the first seven things. Those are for mandatory for every patient. Mm. And then what is among what you can do, hyperbaric oxygen is one straw which you can clutch. Yeah, because let the message go that these seven steps are of most sure. important. Ups after and these seven steps. Yeah. yeah. And the, th the other thing was 
in fluorescein angiography we all talk about uh, the retina yeah. filling time the retinal artery uh, the uh, the central retinal yeah. artery filling yeah. but yeah. the but there is another thing which is another factor which may be there even uh, during the uh, you know in a less severe form and that is the av transit time an av transit time of less than 11 seconds is the normal value when it exceeds 15 seconds you have to think in terms of a cro which has partly recovered you know when it's recovering during that phase there could be a phase when the av transit time is delayed so look for the av transit time also that is also important And so of course, most important, know. most important is ART. Then, Shri, any critical limit for that? You see, beyond twelve, thirteen seconds, or, or because uh, any critical, like you said, one day for the all these seven years, <laughs> and critical ART is. Uh, uh, I I don't think so. There is any critical limit, but uh, generally, it can be uh, anything beyond twenty is considered as delayed. So, if you have uh, like more than twenty seconds of arm to retina time, it's considered as delayed. sometimes it can be very much delayed so it can be even 30 40 seconds also probably it would depend on the amount of uh, occlusion or the, basically it's a very slow circulation for so that might amount for this very much very much delayed time so, so i know I, there I, will be a lot of questions uh, you see but uh, time is not on our side and uh, i would like to take this opportunity to you know on behalf of the entire cfs family and from santosh uh, the creator of this eye focus uh, uh program thank dhanushree for this very very limited talk uh, i know uh, you know there may be a lot of questions and comments but i appreciate dhanushree for taking out time and uh, uh, telling all the audience about this crucial points so for critical points i am very happy to uh, the way you started by paying tribute to the master that is son singh hare which uh, uh, son singh hare uh, people should know that next uh, i think uh, is uh, uh, next i focus is by son singh hare himself Minister, we would have the pleasure. Uh, then I, <laughs> yeah, I would request the Minister in case. So you will produce him because, well. <laughs> because the reason I'm telling you is because you started in a very very nice way by paying tribute to him, uh, because he is the he is the legend and a true true master of this. And I think uh, the last point I had was you see like a lot of investigations apart from those you know basic investigations of lipids, CBC, ESR, temporal arteritis, syphilis, and other things. when and you see hypercoagulability is uh, you know one which is underplayed or or we are ignorant so uh, when should that be because it has to be tailored investigation you can't order all the better investigation in one yes. go to everybody yeah so normally you will do all this routine test uh, as as we do for a normal person and uh, apart from that uh, we always add this homocysteine as the first line of uh, investigation if that comes as positive then we actually don't need to do any further investigation but if that also doesn't come positive then you are again at a loss and then the second line of uh, investigations will include all these like vascularitis workup then yeah. protein s protein c uh, the ana le cell anti phospholipid antibody then such a big uh, list is there so that would probably be the second order of uh, investigations if that also doesn't show anything then we we'll have to go to very specific investigations uh, where you might uh, you know think of some problem but that is little bit rare uh, generally by this time if you you might find some risk factor and if you don't find risk factor then probably you might just uh, simply assume that it could be uh, sometimes as i said could be some transient uh, spasm or something where you will not find any risk factor at all so there are a few percentage of patients maybe about uh, Uh, in my study there were about uh, 10% of patient who did not have any risk factor at all so in those patients we assumed that it could be because of some transient spasm or something like that uh, which has come and gone so you would not have uh, any you know traces of it later on so thanks once again dhanushree for this very very limiting talk on this uh, one of the uh, ophthalmic emergencies which you rightly said every ophthalmologist needs to know this very important points which you have uh, you know educated all of us so over and to the santosh seven mantras and, yeah and, and santosh and yeah <laughs> <laughs> over to santosh or rolika santosh thank you so much thank you for the thank support thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you we'll all see you on 26th of january as lalit sir has already mentioned and the class will be on retinal the vein occlusions and we have the doyen with us <laughs> this uh, time is same 8 to 9 pm on wednesday uh, dr hare will be with us 
So, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Ritesh, Dinesh, Rolika, Santosh, and all the all the you know uh, uh, people who have participated in a very big way, the front uh, hot seat benches. Thanks. Thank we had a good, good, good participation. Sorry. I think today was a genuine involved uh, participation from. So therefore, therefore, I laid importance that before yeah. our comments. Let these uh, people, you know, who, who are there in the front bench, they should ask the first questions. So thanks, everybody. And hope Thank to you. see you soon. Uh, Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night.